So I'm Jean Garrison. I'm the director of the Global and Area Studies Program at the University of Wyoming. We are the program which houses the International Studies BA, MA, as well as minors in European Studies and Asian Studies, and we also have the Arabic Language Program. And we do a lot of series around Wyoming, uh, focusing on uh, outreach, focusing on topics of, of international importance and cultural and social and political issues. Uh, this one here in Centennial is the second program for this summer, um, entitled What in the World? And uh, tonight I'm talking about China. And let me just say, um, to give you a little bit of background on my work in China, and my background is American foreign policy. And I say that so that you know I'm not a Sinologist. <laughs> I'm an expert in American foreign policy. And I came at the interest in China because I did uh, work on American foreign relations with the US and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union disappeared. And then so much of the language about China in the mid-90s, it looked like China was going to be the new Cold War. And so I became very interested in understanding China. Um, I, my first teaching job at Boston University happened to be teaching a course on Russian, the Russian and Chinese revolutions as well as American foreign policy. So I, I was surrounded by colleagues, um, Chinese historian colleagues. Um, I wrote a book, which is actually um, back here. If you're interested in looking at it, I brought a copy up here for the library. And it's Making China Policy. That looks at China, U.S. making of China policy from Nixon all the way to G.W. Bush. So tonight what I'm doing is really kind of building off of that work. And part of that work was done uh, when I was at the State Department on the China uh, Chinese Chinese Affairs and Mongolian Desk at the State Department in, in 2004. And what I'm struck by, I'll just, I'll kind of give, I'll give it away. There's so much continuity in U.S.-Chinese relations. Presidents, regardless of their uh, political affiliation, tend to come around and decide they have to deal with China, even if they come, come to uh, office being very mistrustful of China. We have a very volatile uh, public response to China and then in the domestic political context with Congress on the far left with the human rights agenda, um, also on the right thinking about religious freedom, and then on, on so trade issues. So many issues that impact the U.S.-Chinese relationship now are domestic issues. And those are called intermestic. So you've got the international piece and the domestic piece. Okay, so we have a real strong sense that Congress is playing a role and um, come on in, election cycles exacerbate this kind of friend-enemy dialogue on China. So that's kind of the context for what I'm talking about tonight. And the other piece I would say is I think leaders matter. That's my own bias in my research. I look at presidents. I look at advisors. I look at who is actually making the policy. If you can figure that out and you know what their beliefs are, you can predict it to a certain extent what the policy will be. And the other context is, is that policy is very much a volatile process. It's a lot of give and take among various stakeholders. So you get compromise, you get a lot of wrangling as well. So that's just a little bit of background. And I'll say that um, I'm going to be talking about, um, have some key questions for you to think about um, as we have our discussion tonight. So key questions for um, this lecture. I actually gave a version of this lecture at Shanghai University last summer. And I was teaching a class with Chinese students as well as American students. And it was really interesting to get their attitudes. And what you really find in China is a, a real sense that China has arrived. And that people want the world to recognize that they've arrived and they want to be respected for being a great power. And I think that's where some of the challenges come in the relationship. Um, the language and kind of our rhetoric or our journalism about U.S.-Chinese relations, it's all about the security dilemma. Um, if China builds, a, um, as it has, um, a new aircraft carrier, then we're worried about them having blue water navy. Then we're worried about our presence in East Asia. I um, mean, what you get then is a cycle of kind of mistrust. Um, and there are real reasons for this, because we do have real differences, of course, with China. But I put the definition of the, secu the security dilemma up here, which is very much a real politic, a realism, a Kissinger kind of viewpoint of the world. And that's simply a situation in, one, in which one state's efforts to increase its own security make us feel nervous. And I'm struck by how much 
the parallel or how many parallels there are with the way we view China and the way the Chinese view us as well. So that's kind of one of the takeaway lessons I'd hope to leave you with um, tonight. Uh, will an era of U.S.-Chinese tension be as dangerous as the Cold War? I sure hope not because um, I don't really, first of all, I think it's a much more uneven, I mean, the U.S. does have so much more you know, military presence, and, but the Chinese, with their economic prowess, are really you know, moving forward, and so it concerns a lot of people. Um, I, but it's a debate in Washington, it's a debate in Beijing, it's one of those similarities. And then what is the role of kind of international forces, things like the financial crisis, so I want to put it in that context. Um, what about the domestic politics of, of each side, and then what about the um, leaders themselves? Because China is going through one of its historic every 10 year leadership shifts right now. And so I think we need to think about who the leaders are. And so is China's success a threat? That's really my big question, that um, ironic question I want you to think about. Which worldview or strategy uh, explains it? Well, the de historic debate on China falls along the lines of kind of realism, real politik, that mistrust, spiral of mistrust and concern, the prediction of competition. It's that notion of being zero sum. If China makes a win, we lose, okay? The second one, liberal internationalist, economic interdependence, which is uh, the names I'd put to this are really George H.W. Bush. Um, I'd also say Clinton after um, the early days facing, uh, in the relationship with China. Um, Obama is much more of an economic interdependence um, kind of approach to foreign policy. And this is the notion that China will follow a model of economic and political openness and join the existing world order. Um, it's interesting because that debate has really been undermined because in the context of China's wealth, the financial crisis, then you know that China is actually a force to change the nature of the world system and the multilateral order. And that's something that's very unsettling to um, policymakers. And then how does each perspective manage its perception of threat? Um, clearly, whoops, <laughs> real politique has a much more robust sense of threat regarding China. And this, it's much more of a win-win kind of a scenario. The notion that with, through economic interdependence we depend on each other, it's not a naive perspective. It's a sense that, well, you own my debt. You need me to buy your goods, so we're not going to fight because we need each other. So there's a pragmatic element of that, of shared interest, okay, versus the notion of kind of individual interest, which is what you get with the real politique scenario. Um, U.S.-China security dilemma. I just put a few things up here to think about. Of course, China's rapid modernization. I mean that we think about the Chinese miracle. I think it's so ironic that, that we think of the Chinese miracle, which very much has opened up markets. It is a state capitalist model. It's a model where it's state driven, of course, and they invest into the public sector and that's really what brings about their wealth. But it's ironic that that success is kind of the way we wanted them to go. You know, they've been encouraged to do that for 30 plus years since the opening to China. But from the Chinese perspective, what are they concerned about? The continued alliance with Japan, with South Korea, the continued bolstering and arms sales to Taiwan, the new um, announcement of really having an East Asian policy, which goes everywhere from Australia all the way to India. So they really feel encircled, even though we might think of uh, our presence in East Asia, we just announced in the last few months that we're gonna have cycle through about 2,500 um, U.S., um, I think the Marines, through into Australia to have a presence there. Well, you know, that really raised a lot of questions uh, amongst uh, Chinese leadership, particularly the public um, as well. Um, and the thing that's interesting about looking at U.S. policymakers, there's always a, a little bit of a split um, in U.S. administrations on how they look at China. And historically, the, the, the way they break down is those who are Japan first, kind of East, broader East Asian alliance, and then those who tend to be the China first people. And you can really see, so you can look at the pedigree of the people sitting in the State Department, um, sitting in the Department of Defense, sitting in the National Security Council, and you can look at their training, and it shapes kind of the way they frame um, the options that are available. And, and actually, I was very pleased as I was preparing this talk that you see it in the Obama administration as well. So I see some consistency. Um, and um, I think it's also ironic that the Cold War period, 
In other words, um, particularly Reagan, the Reagan period, before Tiananmen, that was really the honeymoon period. That was when the US and China had a lot of reasons to ignore the differences. They had the big commonality of being anti-Soviet. And that's what really pulled them together. So there's also then a history of when you have a shared strategic interest, um, as in kind of the early uh, post 9-11, there was a little bit of that as well in the context of, of counterterrorism. Because terrorists for the Chinese are people like the Uyghurs, separatists. And so our rhetoric will line up. And we had reasons. So the, the relationship was actually quite stable during much of the Bush administration. It's been a lot rockier in the Obama administration. Um, and so I'll talk about that as well. Um, but it's, it's just interesting that we've had a lot of volatility. Okay. Um, it takes two to tango in this relationship. It takes two to tango in any kind of a security dilemma or a rival scenario where I remember all the cartoons when you think about um, you know, Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny going back and getting bigger, bigger guns and things. That's exactly, that's, that's what an escalation and security dilemma is. Or kind of in the Cold War context of we would build a missile and the Soviet would counter and then we would, we would escalate from that point. Um, I think we should look at how we perceive the Chinese and then how the Chinese perceive us. So I'm a big advocate for trying to understand what motivates the Chinese rather than simply relying on very simple definitions that well, they rely on hard power and you know, they do this. I want to know what the differences are in the context of Chinese leaders. And China is a huge bureaucratic state. They have a lot of different stakeholders. They have a lot of different interests. Um, and it's not monolithic. Okay, so we'll look at some polls. Okay, so this is looking at American, uh, this is a Gallup poll from 1980, of course. 1979 forward is when we formally recognized the PRC as China rather than Taiwan. Um, and since then, then the dark green is looking at the percent favorable, and the lighter green is, is the percent unfavorable. Um, and what you see um, is a lot of volatility, but really a trend toward people, just kind of general run of the mill, normal people, you know, a majority being pretty mistrustful of, of the Chinese. And it, um, you know, it changes depending on, uh, this drop, for example, is very easy to predict, isn't it? You can imagine that this is June 4th or June 5th, <laughs> you know, right after Tiananmen Square. And Tiananmen Square really resonates right now, uh, or has continued to resonate with the American public. And I don't, it's very interesting to me when I will, speak to a Chinese audience and I will talk about how significant that event still is in our lexicon and they don't understand it. But it's really been something that has continues to shape, uh, particularly in the context of congressional debates, um, the relationship with China. So here's another one to think about, another way of looking at. Um, here actually we're looking at China. China's opinion of the United States, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view? Here's the Okay, the Bush years. Now this is again public. Okay, this is the Pew Ad Global Attitude Survey. Um, didn't take it in 2009. Here's the Obama bump, which you see around the world. And then look what's happened. Right, kind of that we're down to 43% favorable um, toward the US. And you see these numbers on, on views of the president. So here are the views of the president. So here's the 2009 bump, looking at Obama, and then a kind of that settling down. Um, this was inevitable, though, wasn't it? This was pretty high. In places like, uh, there's some places um, in East Asia and in Africa where, you know, it's been 90% approval that a bump immediately. And then American presidents, they are American. American interests often irritate people around the world. So this is a pretty sharp decline, but it's pretty natural. But you see he's hovering down here pretty close to some of those late numbers for President Bush. Um, then I thought it'd be interesting for us to think about who do we think the number one or number two economic power is today. Now this again is um, Gallup poll data, so this is Americans. And I think it's just striking that when you have a question such as which one of the following do you think is the leading economic power in the world today and China is at 53% and the United States is 33%, well now that's kind of ridiculous by any measure. Yes, they are the second leading economy, but when you look 
at the domestic situation in China and you add up the challenges they have, you have to see that this is, that, um, this is the result of, they are an economic miracle. They have huge growth rates, which of course trump ours by you know, four or five times, um, even though they've been hit a little bit by this financial crisis. It's really a trade crisis in China, but they're not. When you, when you factor in 700 million people in poverty and a lot of the divides you have between the rich coast and the poor interior, et cetera, et cetera, I can ex elaborate on that if you're interested in the Q&A, um, they aren't the world's leading economic power. They are in terms of trajectory, though, and I think that's what this is measuring. So who's going to be the leading economic power in 20 years? Well, here you get similar kinds of numbers. Um, a little bit lower. Well, that's maybe more true, but it depends on what happens. Whether, you know, it's a real question about whether China can sustain its level of growth. And when you talk about sustainable growth and even just access to cheap energy, which is what they need in order to maintain um, their, their economic growth, and they need political stability as well, um, it gets a little bit more fuzzy in terms of where China will be in 20 years. It's, it's really hard. People always try to predict when is China going to collapse. <laughs> well, and it, and it doesn't. Uh, extremely industrious, um, entrepreneurial, and um, you know they have you know relative to us state control of their economy, and so you know they are trying to move it forward as strategically as they can. Uh, what are the what's the future of U.S.-China relations? Um, I think this is why I'm not a fan of theories like real politic approaches or even that economic interdependence approach because it sounds very deterministic that it has to be this way. It has to be a favorable future or it has to be a future of war. I think it depends on choices that people make. And it really, it's a very robust relationship. And think about it, you have um, at any one time dozens of, um, of uh, bilateral and multilateral negotiations going on from the lowest level up to the highest. And that has expanded so much since George W. Bush became president. And the notion there was that if you're inter more interconnected, that so let's say you have a, a volatile period, okay, Taiwan arms sales, or the president's going to meet with the Dalai Lama. So you cancel some small level, uh, for example, military to military kinds of um, um, discussions or something. But you know what? There's 40 others going on. It's not as big a deal as it was 20 years ago when there's only one or two major things going on. Um, and we know that there's a lot of symbolism in the, in the U.S.-Chinese relationship. So um, if, if uh, you know, we kick out a diplomat or they kick out a diplomat response to something, there's a lot of that, but there's a lot of symbolism. Uh, I'll give you a story. I remember I was at the China desk when um, Ronald Reagan died. And there was, a, um, of course, um, there's always, I mean, Reagan was quite a friend to Taiwan, and the Taiwanese wanted to have a presence at the funeral, which, is, which was in the National Cathedral. Well, um, they, you know, they can't be in the official section. And so we, the Chinese embassy would call up, they're, they're um, essentially reading a script to you, and they're demarching you, telling you why you can't do these things, and it's always the same script. And so we were listening to it and, and smiling a little bit. Uh, but the irony was is that the Chinese um, ambassador in particular did not want, he had to make sure that he didn't want the Taiwanese there first of all, and then the U.S. response was, well, it's, it's a f the family can have them there if they want. Maybe they're not in the official section. And so that was the compromise, put them in the family section. The Taiwanese representatives ended up being much closer <laughs> than the official. And I, I thought that was kind of ironic. Um, but I'm a foreign policy um, expert. And when you come at it from a foreign policy perspective, rather than a security perspective, then you are one who's not a big fan of kind of the structure shaping how states behave. It's much more about domestic politics and how the government structure interacts. So that's really where I sit in terms of my thinking. And that's why I take the global context into account, domestic mm -hmm. context into account, and then kind of see how that shapes leaders' beliefs and the choices that they make. Um, you're not going to be able to read this, so I'll just talk about it a little bit. Um, China is the second leading global economy. It's the second most advancing military currently. Of course, the U.S. is number one. It's also the world's leading oil importer. It's also the number one greenhouse gas emitter. Now, those are not necessarily two measures you want, because what they also have is, is 
50% dependence on foreign oil. They have some of the same dependencies. Um, and it's one of the reasons why they do their outreach strategy, their go forth strategy, to invest wherever possible to get you know, any kind of you know, commodities as well as energy. Um, and they, they have the money to do it, but they have that dependence. So they have a need to keep the Straits of Malacca open too. In some ways it's, it's ironic because what they're doing is they're following some of the same models the U.S. used to do when we had money. So sometimes I think we wish we could do <laughs> some of the things that they're able to do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about George Bush because so many times um, there's this sense that there's such a huge distinction between Bush and Obama. Now there is. I mean, certainly in terms of approach, kind of multilateralism versus unilateral, but you know, the second George W. Bush administration was a very standard American foreign policy presidency. The first term was a little bit, was more of the unilateralism. I mean, administration's mellow. Obama has had very robust rhetoric on multilateralism. Well, you could argue that he's mellowed closer toward real politic. Okay, so you have some you know, interesting uh, similarities. And part of that is, is because both presidents recognize that although there are challenges with China, you have to deal with them. I mean, they're just too big to ignore. And you can't muscle them around, particularly post-2008. They were needed in many contexts. They're needed in most multilateral situations. They were needed in the G20 to have a coordinated response for stimulus packages around the world. Now, after that, they tended to be a thorn in the American side in the context of the G20, but they were needed. They're needed if you're ever going to get a resolution on Iran, if you're going to get a coordinated response on Iran. They're needed if you're going to have a coordinated response on North Korea. Um, they're certainly needed when they're your banker. Um, so, that, so those are the contexts of that economic interdependence being important. Um, I think they, I'm pretty convinced that um, many in the Chinese leadership wish they had George Bush back because they understood hard power. They understood, and you know, Obama shifted around a little bit, and it's been a little bit of a mixed message, and they're a little, you know, it's harder to figure out how to how to respond um, to the United States, um, and Chinese confidence and trajectory. You know, they're more confident today than they were four years ago, and they want to be respected. They want to be listened to, and if you don't do that, then it causes problems. I mean, one of the things that all presidents meet with the Dalai Lama. All presidents sell arms to Taiwan. The U.S. sold two packages to Taiwan. That was more, you know, than in the past years. Presidents met with Dalai Lama a couple different times. Um, those are, although minor, seemingly minor, very symbolic in the Chinese context. You know, it's a real big deal because they still see China or Taiwan as a, as a renegade province officially, anyway. And then the economic miracle. I mean, 10 plus percent growth over the last 25 years, sometimes is 15, 16 percent. Looks like it's sitting at about seven to seven and a half percent right now. I mean, they're very reliant on trade. They're very reliant on government. Um, they had a huge government stimulus package, which they poured into actually green energy and, and, and green housing projects. And they're facing a housing bubble. They're facing rising inflation. So um, they have um, big gaps between rich and poor. Um, so they have a lot of, that's what I mean about the domestic context that we should understand. And number one, the Chinese leadership are very conservative and stability minded. And so many of them remember being sent down to the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. They remember what populist fervor does and they get nervous. And so that they often overreact to things like the Uyghurs. Um, I don't know, but um, within the last couple of days we have another Tibetan monk who set himself on fire. And they're very nervous, and their, their reaction, or their first reaction is to clamp down very hard. Um, and part of that is, is their memory, because some of them went down to the countryside. Actually, the one who will be, uh, Xi, who will be the incoming leader, he was sent down to the countryside for five years as well. Um, if you're not familiar with that, if you remember, there was a power struggle um, with Mao, and um, when, the cult, when the Red Guards, the youth, <laughs> Kind of, they threw out, you know, they, they were throw, throwing out the elitists, is what they said. Uh, but a lot of the leadership, teachers, um, a lot of members of the Chinese Communist Party, they were sent out into the countryside to relearn their peasant roots, essentially. And they spent years out there. And you have a lost generation there that closed the universities, closed the schools. And that's still the group that's, that's actually in power. <laughs>
Um, the Great Recession um, has led to a loss of at least 20 million jobs um, in China. Um, and we have rising inflation. And here I put down, you know, 8.2% estimated growth for, for 2012. It sounds great, doesn't it? Keep in mind that Chinese leadership, they do a calculation and they, they feel very vulnerable politically if their growth goes below about 7%. So they see that as that, you know, they have to deliver on that. And they see that as a way to kind of placate people. And, and they have brought, you know, four or 500 million people out of poverty. They call the recession the made in America crisis. Now this is an, so the lesson of this, the, the number one kind of theme off of this slide is that the, those in China which have always thought that the US model was self-correcting and that the US knew how to design a market economy. And again, you remember they're very evolutionary in their approach. Okay, the recession and the handling of finances in this country have completely undermined that group in China. That's your group, which, is, which are moderate economic reformers. Now, maybe some of them want political reform, but we know that political reform is anathema to most of them. But the economic opening, the loosening up so that you have more private, private sector, you know, market economy, loosen up on state-owned enterprises and things like that, that model has been undermined. And so in that sense, then economic, you could say, kind of popu the populists, those who want to continue um, with the state control of the economy, you know, they're, 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 they can point to the U.S. and say, look. So in a sense, we have undermined our ability to influence the Chinese and strengthen those reformers by our behavior. And I think it's really important to understand that context when you think about whether we can tell China what to do. Because then it becomes much more of a style thing, much more of a give and take. And I think it's very hard um, for our country to think in those terms vis-a-vis -vis most countries. But I think we have to, if we want to have any influence, think about how we approach it. Because you can, you can have an interest and you want to think about, you know, you want to use the tools that are most effective for you. And sometimes um, we can be a bull in a china shop. And it's a little bit harder to do that with... Um, China today, and it tends to strengthen those hardliners, which concern most people. Um, and there's a Chinese leadership shift that I mentioned coming up. And the thing to keep in mind when you think about um, the Chinese leadership, it's an oligarchy. Uh, there's a lot of corruption. There, it's not one single leader. As a matter of fact, it's a lot easier. I mean, in the good old days, it was a lot easier to deal with Mubarak. Well, in China, it is, it's an oligarchy. There's a, there's a number of people, you know, there's the Central Committee of the Communist Party. There's a whole, there's a, you know, there's a whole group of people and they disagree, okay? They have different interests. Some of them, at, on the very most simple level, those that are more open to at market reform and those who want more state control of the economy. That's a fundamental factional shift and fight going on in China today. And that's historic. Uh, it's been going on for over 30 years. And then there's kind of the, that real politique mistrust of outsiders because they're encircling us and those that would argue no economic interdependence it's in our best interest to work with people um, so you have that kind of shift as well on the security side um, and so one of my perspectives has always been it's in your interest to strengthen the more moderate voices in the context of the Chinese state um, so what's happening this time is is a huge shift um, 60 percent turnover in the Central Committee. Now the most volatile, this happens every 10 years, well the Cultural Revolution came out of this and Tiananmen Square came out of the one in, you know, in 1989, so in that period. So right now, it is the smartest thing you can do right now, I would argue, is not poke your finger in the bee's nest. Just as our, our election cycles makes our kind of discussions about China you know, more volatile, same thing is going on in the context of China. And this transition doesn't, isn't completed until the fall. They're also, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to do anything radical. Because one of the things about um, the new president is that he has a lot of rivals. He doesn't have the strongest base, not like the older leaders, not the kind of authoritarian leaders we think about like Mao or Deng Xiaoping. Um, Hu Jintao currently is like that as well. He's had major, you know, major rivals. And so um, 
they have to get consensus within the group before they can do things. It tends to make them much more conservative and slow. And I think that's been very, it's very frustrating when you're trying to get China to move. They're not going to move fast, particularly in the next six months. So there's a competitive coalition of populists uh, who want to close economic gaps um, and kind of address poverty in the western regions. Um, remember the huge wealth along the coast because that's where the special economic zones are put in place, you know, Shanghai, um, you know, Beijing to a lesser extent, down around Hong Kong, of course. Um, and then just huge, anybody who's traveled China, you just see the contradictions um, from extreme wealth. You can see the most cosmopolitan city in the world, parts of Shanghai, to the most, you know, abject poverty that you'll see anywhere in the world. Um, the incoming um, president, the one who made such a big deal because he visited Iowa, you know, kind of had that connection because, again, he'd been sitting down the countryside for five years. Um, so he's very, he's got that appeal to populists. So kind of that, that cultural revolution um, element. Um, the thing, the, it's, it reminds me of the, the Stalin phenomenon in, in Russia, how people hearken back to the good old days. There's a group of people who hearken back to the good old days of egalitarianism under Mao, even though it was really a, um, <laughs> You want, they wouldn't say it this way, but it was really a license to starve, <laughs> and, you know, equally in many contexts. But, you know, Mao is, he's a unifying figure, and the rhetoric from Mao is sharing. It's not that I moved into Shanghai, my kids don't have access to any of it because I'm illegal, my, act, my kids don't have access to schools, and I see this rich person over here driving Mercedes, etc. It's everybody has the same, and so it's very appealing. And again, when you have about 700 million people who are, haven't really reached that dream, um, you know, you have a large group of people to appeal to. That really terrifies a lot of people in the central leadership of the Communist Party. And, and also keep in mind that, that although we're, there, we're talking about people who believe in free market, they're, they're so in thick with those state-owned enterprises, they have lined their own pockets. So they're often owners and, and shareholders in state-owned enterprises. So, you know, there's a lot of um, nepotism going on. That's how they've gotten wealthy. Um, and that's why, um, that's why when you get Bo Xi Lai, people like that who are really anti-corruption, and he was the one who was you know, kicked out, um, it's very appealing to people, even though he was doing exactly the same thing. Very, very corrupt. Um, but the new leadership has to find a way to kind of maintain a positive relationship with Washington because Fundamentally, they don't want too much friction with the U.S. because they need, they need stability on their borders in order to maintain their growth. And that does motivate them um, to be careful in dealing with Washington. And they also recognize that Washington and the U.S. and those, their neighbors around them can really affect their ability to continue to progress. Um, but um, there's a growing nationalism in China, particularly among the youth. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I got a lot of questions when I was doing the American foreign policy lectures on, why do you have to invade everybody? Why do you always want to kill people? Of course, they're looking, thinking of Iraq and, um, and, you know, I was really, really wondering why are we so aggressive? Um, and sometimes that kind of nationalism can, especially around very symbolic issues like Taiwan, and other things, that can actually box in the leadership. And they, sometimes they have to react because of domestic politics. Public opinion sounds familiar, doesn't it? That sometimes public opinion can drive it. It can happen in China, too. The Chinese leadership used to manipulate that. I think they did in the context of Tiananmen Square. Now, with social media um, and access to information, I mean, it, it can turn around on them. So some of them, they don't want to be taken over by the passion of particular issue agendas sometimes. President Obama, so finally I'm talking about Obama, after all this kind of background. Well, you know, Obama you know, went to Asia very early, sent Secretary of State Clinton to Asia as the first trip. You always make sure that you go, you always have to go to Japan and Korea, sometimes you add in China. This time they actually added in Indonesia too, which is an interesting change. Um, but you need, there, the President has said you do need to treat China as a country of consequence bilaterally, regionally, and multilaterally. So there's kind of, there's been an assessment that this is an objective reality. We do have to deal with them that way. There's also that sense that, um, that it's an accurate measurement, uh, you know, f from the perspective of Chinese leaders. Um, it doesn't mean that we've gotten our difficulties resolved any more easily, however. If anything, it's complicated it. 
Um, but one thing Obama did that is interesting, um, although his first year until the first summit in 2009, there wasn't really a crisis. I mean, the pattern has tended to be that presidents come in, whether they're talking about Clinton was M the most favored nation status like the human rights, um, calling, um, the, you know, calling George H.W. Bush allied with the butchers of Beijing. You know, maybe you remember that. Came in with a very strong human rights agenda. Maybe you remember that George W. Bush had the EP3 incident. You know, the plane that got taken down over Hainan Island, the Chinese held on to it. And it was really a thorny, I mean, a lot of, I mean, the U.S. wouldn't apologize, China is demanding apologies, and uh, it got sorted out. But, but George W. Bush came in very hard line and very concerned on China post EP3, post 9-11, moderated his stance quite a bit. Um, and then even, um, although George H.W. Bush, so the elder, very pro-China, I mean, after all, he had been head of the office before China, you know, under Ford, before China was formally recognized, uh, had real, um, very good foreign policy credentials, um, much better foreign policy credentials than any president since, um, in terms of experience and varied experience. Um, very much a friend of China, but then Tiananmen Square derailed that, and he's recovering from that um, for quite a long time. When you look at who actually made China policy um, in the Obama administration through the fall of 2011, it's actually um, Jeff Bader, who was head of the East Asia um, office in the National Security Council, um, and then James Steinberg, who was number two in the State Department. Old China hands, knew a lot about it. They're the ones who are making policy. They're the ones who are much more moderate, kind of that um, responsible stakeholder, that notion that you can make China part of the system, and then if, we can, if you can make them part of the system, then that will moderate their behavior, and they'll behave like a normal state, so to speak. The reason I mention this and go that far down into the bureaucracy is because they're not there anymore. You know, they're, they've rolled out of government. Uh, Jeff is back in, in Brookings, and um, I, don't know if, I don't know if Jim's in Brookings, but he's, he's somewhere in that circle. Um, and so the reality of the Bush, or excuse me, not Bush, the Obama administration is, is that those differences have come to the fore in terms of people's thinking. You have at least two camps in the Obama administration in terms of how to interpret China. Um, presidents frustrated over China's lack of responsive, responsiveness on a host of issues. That's nothing new. Uh, and yet there's that frustrating sense that you still have to deal with them. Um, I, I mentioned that um, we've got a much more robust uh, and integrated Asian strategy from India to um, Australia. Um, and that's really made the Chinese nervous. Um, and then we have that, but we do have that constant communication. That's that constant symmetry from the highest levels all the way down to very low uh, and working levels within the government. Um, you know, technically, state and treasury tend to have the lead um, on this, and it's through the strategic and economic dialogue once a year. Geithner and Clinton go over and they have a series of, of meetings. Um, what's interesting about that, and the reason I mentioned it is, it's that link between strategic issues and economic. So it, that d dialogue is infused with the sense that we are economically interdependent. And so there's that sense that there are limits to what you can do. And there's a current two-pronged approach, those who want to reaffirm and strengthen cooperative ties, and those who want a more robust and credible presence in Asia, i.e. troops, strengthening alliances, uh, et cetera. Um, so there's an agreement that overall Asia is very important. There's agreement that you have to deal with China. Uh, there's agreement that it's a very difficult rep uh, relationship. And the long and short of this is, is that we do have a little bit of a tougher stance coming out of the Obama administration now, partly because of the people who are involved. Um, the Department of Defense has a much more robust presence. Um, State Department, um, different people. It's actually Kurt Campbell um, in the State Department who is you know, coming out of the, the Japan camp. I mean, very well respected in kind of policy circles, but has a little bit different take on priorities in East Asia. And what's the Chinese response? worry, reinforces Chinese suspicions. The leadership is unsure of Obama and his approach. Uh, what are the real politic lessons? Kind of back to that Kissinger notion of um, cycles of potential conflict. 
Um, I think that structurally, this is economic interdependence. Structurally, there are so many reasons to cooperate. It's just practical because our economy is derailed, their economy is derailed, we go down together, so to speak, if it becomes a hot, uh, a hot conflict. Um, and so that leads you to think of share, where can you share your interests? Problem with that is we have so many potential flashpoints. Taiwan is unresolved. North Korea is unresolved. Uh, Tibet, when we, when we get concerned about human rights. And so there are a lot of people who focus on China who don't want single issue agendas, i.e. Taiwan, human rights, to derail everything. And it's not so much that they're not unsympathetic to the issues, they just think it's, it's going down a garden path. Okay, it doesn't lead anywhere except where neither group really wants it to go. But, you know, is it, a, is it a mild or severe security dilemma? I guess it depends on what you think about some of these issues we just talked about. Long-term U.S. commitment to Taiwan, if that's kind of your core, then of course it's a huge security dilemma because there are real possibilities, um, particularly when Taiwan independently tries to push, you know, independence. Uh, so what's, what are the lessons here? Be careful not to exaggerate the threat because it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so I'm not, I, I really don't see China, I actually think seeing China as a threat is a luxury in essence because I think you have to manage, uh, you know, in mature relationships you have to manage differences and you have to try to move them forward, particularly if you want to see your interests um, um, represented. So here's my answer, no. Is China's success a threat? No. Um, Security dilemma is part of the bilateral relationship. Um, I think it's there. I think we're going to disagree. You have to pick and choose where you can influence. Um, how do you break down the dilemma? You try to encourage transparency. This is very frustrating because it's very, very slow. And it does involve you know, pressure. It involves a lot of diplomacy. But you know, we do have at least 60 ongoing bilateral talks currently. Well, there's a lot of room, but what are we most frustrated by? I think we're most frustrated by things like intellectual property. <laughs> things that are just extremely thorny. Um, I'm a, you know, in a sense, I focus on strategic issues. I never thought I'd get interested in something like intellectual property. But I really recognize that this is extremely frustrating. Um, and the rhetoric China has on opening up is the same as it was eight or nine years ago. It hasn't really shifted. But we have a very uncomfortable reality to deal with, and that is, is that, um, we can't, we don't walk in the room anymore and say something and it happens. I think that was always a little bit simplistic, but it's even less true today. Uh, China can reshape the global economy and how it functions, it already has. Um, and maybe we don't, maybe that's unsettling, I think it's quite unsettling. Uh, growing dominance of trade and large amount of foreign exchange reserves, they own a lot of the U.S. debt, that's my comment, don't kick your banker. They have huge appetites for natural resources, which are finite, and do affect, I mean, two leading consumers of, of resources. So the, a lot of the research I do is actually looking at energy security, but, um, so I can talk about that. But I would argue China is not monolithic. We say China does this. China went in and it did this and had this great plan. You know what China is? It's a bloated bureaucracy, which is slow, which is oligarchic, which is consensus driven, which is very conservative, um, it's fragmented authoritarianism, which means they fight. A lot of fights over things like energy policy um, approach to the U.S. I gave you a couple of examples of that. That means that we shouldn't think of them as being strategic, as strategic, that we may, they sound strategic, their ability to implement what they say is limited. They have a greater ability than we do many times because they control resources a little bit more directly. But I think that when we say China went in and did this, I think we give them more power than they actually have. And I think we shouldn't overemphasize what they can do. Um, and then just think of their per capita challenges. 700 million people in poverty, rising inflation, um, great fear of political instability. Um, so you know, they're often doing things because of domestic constraints. I think we think they're doing it in reaction to us. Sometimes they're doing it just because um, they're doing it domestically. How much of our foreign policy is domestically driven? Almost 100%. I don't think we're very strategic either. I think we want to be more strategic than we are. Um, so that's actually my setup for now your questions. <laughs>
Yeah. I know that this kind of goes into some of the things that you said. There was an article in Smithsonian a couple months ago written by an intelligence expert uh, talking about the fact that we get so much of our computer technology and our chips and all of that mm -hmm. sort of things manufactured in China. And his fear was, what are they planting in there? Mm -hmm. And his, his statement was, we're going to die, what was it, something like, we're going to die the death of a thousand cuts. <laughs> I, yeah. you know, how, what is your reaction to that kind of statement? I'll, do, I'll be honest, my first reaction is I don't know, per se, but yeah. I'll give you my educated response. And my first response is, is that I think the U.S. did that with Iran. Right. They and did. specifically going yeah. after, you know, their, um, their enrichment facilities. And in a sense then, um, um, it got found out and um, actually opened up the door. But it kind of reminds me of opening the door to nuclear. Right. So in that sense then, oh boy, do you remember what Eisenhower's response was? It was open skies. It was kind of this half-hearted attempt to kind of manage it. I would actually really, um, I guess I'd come back to the perspective that um, our best bet in dealing with China is to make them feel secure rather than insecure. Um, I think it's on the table for a tool of foreign policy. Um, I, honestly, though, it's it's there's one there would be the, it would be the People's Liberation Army. It'd be the hardline faction that would be pushing that. So um, just like just like we have different perspectives and people pushing different sorts of things, um, and so. Um, if it's occurring, which it probably is, um, it doesn't seem to be any way to really stop it. I don't have, I don't have that answer. So I, I think it's a concern, but my response would be to think of it as opening, how it's very similar to opening up the landscape for the way we have kind of the proliferation of, of you know, the nuclear question from the 50s, late 40s and 50s. And so I would actually make an attempt to get people to table. And honestly, Talking, to, you lose nothing by talking. You don't give up anything by talking. Um, you don't gain anything if you don't. So I guess that's my, my response. Um, it's not a very good answer, though. It's very Chinese. I'm interested in the question of Taiwan. It, it seems to me that the mainland is taking a very long view of the Taiwan question, and it seems to me that there may thrust is to so fully integrate the economy of Taiwan with, may I say, the rest of China, that uh, it would be inconceivable uh, for them to declare independence and try and break away. If the inconceivable were to happen, I can't imagine that the Chinese are going to accept that militarily. They'll act militarily, and that will put them in a collision course with us. And what are we going to do? I don't think we can control the Taiwan Straits anymore. I think they've now reached the point where militarily they would dominate the Taiwan, uh, the Taiwan Straits, and uh, you know, are we going to launch a nuclear war and mutual destruction of our of, 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 of our countries over that? I mean, I see it as a dangerous mm -hmm. uh, as as a as a dangerous situation, but that seems to me to be the Chinese strategy, and I myself personally would be very surprised if a hundred years from now Taiwan were not. Uh, a province of the People's Republic of China, mm -hmm. perhaps with some special conditions, like you see in Hong Kong and and, and Macau. Uh, um, but I, I mean, you know, you know, what do you think of what I think? Well, <laughs> yeah, I think it was easy to believe that ten years ago than it is today, because yeah. um, there was hope that um, the Macau model, the Hong Kong model, would be the answer for Taiwan. It was just rejected on the part of the Taiwanese. It's hard to. I mean, it was a lot easier to, to think about it in terms of when Taiwan was not democratic. But now Taiwan is very democratic, so symbolically it's very hard for us not to support Taiwan. So, and then I'm back to that point that domestic politics matters. And, then, and the U.S. Congress matters. And we have a, res we have a statutory responsibility to respond right, with the Taiwan, the Taiwan Relations Act. There's a lot of ambiguity. The strategic ambiguity over Taiwan and Taiwan Straits is so it's frustrating. It is very, it, it's dangerous. I think we're kind of back to um, the context of flashpoints. But come on, what would the Chinese do? What's the difference between one missile? You know, it's not like it's going to be like zero to 100. I think there are gradations of responses on the part of the Chinese 
in the context of Taiwan trying to declare independence. And keep in mind, there's only one group that advocates that. You have others who are very much along the lines of we're integrated with China. Uh, or who are looking for a deal. Okay, they're looking for a deal with a certain amount of um, autonomy, right? That's what we're talking. The magic word here is autonomy. And the, the U.S. administration and the Chinese get on the phone immediately when the Taiwanese start shaking the independence tree because neither of them want that. But it is a, it's so, Taiwan is so volatile in the, na in the rising nationalism in the context of the Chinese youth that that's one of those things that it, it, it's hard it's hard to predict. Um, yes, if, if you're kind of being sane and you're thinking about wealth and maintaining wealth and if you can accept autonomy, sure. It doesn't make sense, self, mutual self-interest, but we've had a lot of crises where um, things get out of hand. And that's why I think those connections, the, the, you know, having the phone to call up the Chinese leadership and kind of calm things down, that's the thing that would say that I think it's those kind of connections which allow you to talk to one another. But you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to fly from Taiwan to the mainland, you had to fly via Hong, Hong Kong, Kong right. and or you someplace else. I mean, today, there are okay. direct air links between dozens of cities on the mainland and Taiwan. Yes, but you There are millions and millions of Taiwanese living on the mainland. There are millions of mainlanders living in Taiwan. And if you ask the, the Chinese population, is Taiwan a part of China? The answer is yes. Absolutely. And that's my point about if you're in a crisis decision-making mode where, you're, where you're, you're being cornered and you need to make very quick decisions, uh, that's, it, it, that's where it becomes volatile. That's the point of you know, flashpoints and the danger of flashpoints. If you stand back and you think about how it's mutual suicide to go down that route, then I think of course. But, I mean, there are scenarios where um, it's, it's less likely, but there are scenarios where it can spin, it can spin out of control. Okay, I'll just say that if, if Mitt Romney becomes president, um, I think he'll go through the same shift that the Bush administration did. Kind of coming in more hardline on China, recognizing the reality of China, moderate back. Okay, huge consistency and continuity across presidents, regardless of Republicans, be Republican or Democrat. It's the Congress and it's the role of the Congress that is kind of a different, which is different over the last 20 years. Um, again, you know, if you believe in economic interdependence, you answer that question one way. If you're more real politic, hard going real politic, you answer another way. So the beliefs do matter. Other questions? Yeah. Who else matters in China relations with the rest of the world? You talked about the US, China. Mm -hmm. Um, you mean countries or? Yeah, well, or even, I mean, does the UN matter? Or what? Oh. Now, increasingly, <coughs> the UN matters because they're, um, the Bush policy was to make China a responsible stakeholder. Um, and, to, and actually to encourage China to become more involved in multilateral organizations and then to kind of build consensus in approaches to countries like Iran and, and the six party talks in the context of, of North Korea. Um, etc. So the notion is that if you make them such a part of the system, they're embedded into it, so they will have the same shared interests, right? Constrained by economic independence, um, etc. Um, in a way of <coughs> mitigating those, the hardline voices. Um, who else matters? Um, well, when, when you have a um, when you increasingly have issues that require um, concerted uh, or um, the effort of multiple states to address them, then it, it's very important. Um, when in the context of where the UN acts as kind of the umbrella for setting up solutions to problems, I mean um, Syria. I mean, if you're going to have, any, you know, it's, it's a useful <coughs> umbrella, but you've got to have the Chinese and the Russians there for that kind of concerted effort. And if you're if you're an administration that's reluctant to actually do anything in the context of Syria, then you want that shared you, you want the you want the shared burden as well as the legitimacy. Of course, you're going to want the Arab League and a whole host of, of other things. In the context of Iran, when your strategy is to use UN mechanisms, then China is very important. It makes the kind of overall um, model. But I mean, the UN matters in some areas and not in others. Um, matter very much in a lot of low policy or low security issues. Um, who else matters? Um, I used to think, this is a little bit in response to your question about how do you solve Taiwan, 
When I was um, in, on, you know, in the State Department in uh, 2004, I thought the model they were looking at was actually the EU. And that kind of, kind of uh, confederation, loose model, I thought that was the model they were looking at as a way to solve China and how it would integrate um, Taiwan back in. Um, and you know, we know what happened there. <laughs> Um, so, and, you know, this is a very state-centered discussion, right? the, the countries are what matter the most, um, but I think economically you can't see a scenario, so WTO, anything involving trade, you have to, you know, it's just U.S.-China are the two in the room. Um, I mean, China was approached to provide loans to, in the European context, right? And so, I mean, they, they're just, they're the ones with the deep pockets now. Um, yeah, let me see if there's anybody else and I'll come back to you, Dan. Yes? Uh, could you deal with the subject of policy making? Because mm -hmm. it seems very squishy. You talked mm -hmm. about having 30 or 40 groups having dialogue about various issues. Mm -hmm. Well, then how do we come to a policy and who adopts it and uh, does it get set in concrete, or is it just kind of floating out there in the ether? It, it's very, I, I, I can't get a handle on a handle policy. On <laughs> um, well, when you have an issue like, um, you're at least on the U.S. side on most issues going to have, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good one for you to get them all. Um, when you have, you're going to have, on the U.S. side, you're going if, if you're talking about a multilateral or a bilateral kind of negotiation, um, there's going to be a lead. Usually, one agency is going to take a lead, and then the others are going to kind of be in the room. Um, and so that's why it matters who gets that lead. Is you know, State Department has a tendency to focus on the broader relationship, making it diplomatic tools, foreign policy. I don't want to be too simplistic here. But um, I remember sitting in on intellectual property discussions and how much more hard nosed the Department of Commerce was, you know, for example. And so when you're sitting there as a, the, the State Department representative, you're, just, you're, you're wanting to maintain that overall relationship. And here's somebody who only deals with, you know, intellectual property rights involving media. And they're just hammering and hammering. And you're just sitting back, you know, kind of grinding your teeth, thinking about, well, you're not going to get anywhere. And, you know, you're, it, it will derail the broader relationship. So that's why kind of perspectives are different. Um, in the in energy context, when you have um, China, thinking of China, actually um, it depends on the aspect that you're looking at. Sometimes it will be um, the, the um, defense group that has the lead on some things. China tends to put together these um, leading groups which bring together the stakeholders at the very highest level, and they tend to make decisions that way, and it's consensus driven. Uh, and, but where you really get it, where it really gets thorny, which I think is what your question is, is in implementation. They might agree on something, but we know that there's a big gap between an agreement and whether it gets carried out. Remember during the um, Cuban Missile Crisis when um, uh, John F. Kennedy ordered a, a naval uh, blockade, they wouldn't even call it a blockade, right? And uh, he wanted it, I, I might get this wrong, I think he wanted it 500 miles, no, he wanted it 250 miles around, outside around um, Cuba, so that he'd have more time before the Soviet ships reached the blockade. And what did the Navy do? They followed the book. When you implement a blockade, it's 500 miles. So, now that wasn't a deliberate, wasn't deliberate, but implementation follows standard operating procedures. And policy up here, and we're a huge bureaucracy as well. And that happens more. You know, that's very, very common. And he, one of the things interesting about China is huge implementation gap between what the Chinese say they're going to do and what actually happens. Provinces are the ones that control uh, economic growth. They're the ones that kind of keep their jobs based on economic growth. And so if the Chinese government has a new um, environmental policy which says, you're going to close these non-performing coal plants. What happens? If somebody comes down and look, they turn it off. When they go back to Beijing, they turn it back on. So on the books, they have scrubbers on all their coal plants. They just don't turn them on. Okay, because it's more expensive. And so I think we need to keep in mind, think about how our states push back against the federal government. <laughs> the provinces do that to Beijing. 
So Beijing doesn't have, that's what I mean about them not being monolithic, because many times they can't actually carry it out in the way they would like. And you really see that in economic policy and, um, and environmental standards that the Chinese central government is trying to impose um, on provinces. If you're really poor, the last thing you want to do is have people lose jobs. If people lose jobs, then it's a political instability issue and you get concerned. Um, so there's a lot of, um, you know, let's blame the, lo the central government will blame the local guy, throw him in jail, and that takes the pressure off. It's kind of a pressure cooker sometimes. A lot of protests with tens of thousands of people every year in China. We don't hear about a lot of them, but there's a, there's a lot of them. They tend to be economic in orientation, but they make people nervous. I mean, after all, Tiananmen Square started out as an anti-inflation and job kind of a protest. It wasn't a democracy protest. We called it a democracy protest. They had great cameras there because Gorbachev was coming. It was on the media. It wasn't pro-democracy. It became that when the students got there. So we actually, I think we, we misunderstand what Tiananmen Square really was. But actually, they're a lot less receptive to reform today than they were in 1989. There was a real debate, how do we respond to Tiananmen Square? The reformers lost. And uh, there, was, there was a real debate about what do we do now? Um, and that's where that hope that economic reform would lead to political reform really got on the skids, even you know, in, in the way we think about it too. I think we always hope that if they would move toward a free market economy, it would lead to, to democratic reform, right? I think the Chinese have demonstrated that they can resist that sense of linkage. <laughs> I don't think those two are linked, by the way, at all. Um, I think there's a lot of local context that you have to take into account. Uh, Dennis. Okay. <coughs> I have heard that um, the likelihood or the possibility of getting significant uh, conservation and environmental protection done in China in a timely way, fairly quickly, is more likely than it is in the United mm -hmm. States, where we have to get such a large amount of grassroots <coughs> support and we have to work through the Congress and it seems like there's so much debate involved, mm -hmm. and it just takes so long to get something done. Uh, I wonder if you feel like there's something to that or not, or do the Chinese, maybe often just like here in the U.S., we do conservation and environmental protection when it seems to make good business sense? Uh, I, I think it's uneven. Um, I think there's a growing civil society in urban areas where the more wealthy Chinese live. They want cleaner air. They want standards. Um, and in many cases, um, they, they have an ability to join organizations, actually push for it, and they do get change. Okay. Um, Top down. Uh, yeah, but they're working at the provincial level as well. There are a lot, like I said, there are a lot of, um, lot of okay, energy efficiency standards, a good example. It, why, it, why does that move forward? Well, it, it has fantastic um, environmental benefits, per se. Uh, but it also saves a lot of money, and China's um, consumption is so high that they will do anything to save. Uh, they will actually put costs in so that energy isn't so cheap, so that people will start to conserve. Because they recognize that their trajectory is, is they can't stay on that trajectory for very long. So it, I guess in that sense, it makes good, it makes good economic sense to do some of these things. I thought you were going to ask the question a little bit differently. I've gotten the question, which is uh, related along the lines about you know frustration over EPA re regulations, and et cetera. And one of my responses is we live in a, a system which values pluralism. It is frustrating, but that's the system that we value. In a more authoritarian system, they have an ability. It looks efficient, doesn't it? But it's also very easy to say, well, look, well let's go in. We're going to move a million five people and we're going to put in three gorgeous dams. Now, you know, what about property rights? And what about your, your right to live where you want to live and things like that? So in that sense, then, I think we're glad to have that slow process <laughs> in place. So, um, but then why, you know, so I flip it around. So even when you're talking about conservation, I guess I would say the same kind of thing. Um, I think um, it makes, it does make good economic sense in the areas of things like efficiency, um, conservation of, of resources, um, as a matter of fact, um, energy was so cheap that people were leaving lights on, having extremely inefficient heating systems in buildings, and they put standards in. 
just so that they could import less. So I guess my answer is yeah, when it makes sense economically, it seems to move forward more. But I, I, I'm struck by, particularly in robust, wealthy urban areas where people are living in you know, terrible pollution, and now they have, you know, they were looking, they were checking the U.S. Embassy to see what the air quality was <laughs> in Beijing and also at the consulates. Well, actually, there was such a, there was such a public outrage. It's now legal for you to have those. And, and they used to not report that information, now they do. And so um, that's one good thing about kind of an interested, very educated population. And they do live in terrible circumstances. Um, and... Um, but then again, when you see kind of places that become like national parks, kind of areas of conservation, um, boy, they still get millions and millions of visitors. So it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like rebuilding that Tibetan monastery because you've got people to visit <laughs> and make a lot of money. Ruth, did you have a question? I'll come to you again after. Well, I had more of a comment because, you know, as we're valuing our private property rights and taking what we hold near and dear to us and our ability to have diversity of opinion in a natural resource uh, economic conflict area. Um, I thought the Chinese response to a lot of what goes on, and okay, I work in kind of a heady environment. It's university people, it's young university students, and then it's faculty and their uh, deans and directors. But even the elderly on the street are willing to say, we'll do this for the greater good. They recognize that they are behemoth in sheer human numbers. And so there's, I see that that used to be in our dialogue in the 1950s. We thought about the greater good for everyone in the United States and moving into the middle class. That's gone from our dialogue. We. We don't even like to say in rural communities in Wyoming that we'll do something for the greater good of people in Detroit anymore. And yet you still have that dialogue in China. So I'd kind of like to hear what you think about that because I think that's a big move. There's, there's a question in there? Yeah, just, you oh. know, from what I, from what Is I said. Is the question, are the Chinese more progressive than the Americans? Is that the question? Um, oh, I don't know when you see people who very rapidly pull themselves out of poverty in a generation. Um, there's, um, when you look at the, um, the people who have the rhetoric of the common good are the people's, or is the Communist Party. It's fundamental. And yet they're the ones who are the most, have the, have the corruption, the nepotism, and have, and have gained the wealth, and they're embedded in the system, and they're one of the reasons, they're the ones who are actually holding on very much to not sharing power. So I guess that's one way of thinking about it. I guess you're really talking about the common person. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's very. I, I think there's. Well, I think this. I think there's a. You know, I think there's an optimism and there's a hope, and I think there's a sense of that among university yeah. students that they they're proud of their country. They are amazed at what they've accomplished. They should be amazed at what, the, what has been accomplished yeah. in 25 or 30 years. I mean, it's amazing. And they are, they are aware of the contradictions. Um, and um, in many cases, they have grandparents that are living back in rural areas. Um, and many of them, kind of, kind of like our generation, who want to get in the Peace Corps, or, or even people who want to do AmeriCorps, there's that sense of wanting to go out and help people. I do think that exists. Yeah. But I think that's in general of that age group. And I, and I think because they're wealthy, there's a sense that we, you know, it's interesting, there's a sense that we can do it. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I think one of the things that's part of American thinking is, well, we, did, we identify the problem, and then we can go do it. I do think there's a sense of confidence in being able to do that. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I see students like that because I see the students who are studying language. Who are, I mean, so we do see the group. We do. That do. You yeah. know, one of the things that's happening to the youth, though, is there's a high unemployment among the youth, and so college-educated people are having a heck of a time getting a job. It's, mm -hmm. it's happening here, too. And so it, it's, you know, it's, there's some counter trends going on. But yeah, I, I think that is true. <laughs> It's, it's interesting, a lot of youth from here, mm -hmm. of course, are going to China, and a lot of European youth also are going to China because they think the job prospects and career prospects are better there than they are here. 
But I wanted to ask you something mm -hmm. completely different than the other questions we've been dealing with. Uh, I saw, uh, uh, what do we call him, you know, ex-ambassador, ex-governor Huntsman, mm -hmm. ex-candidate, <laughs> mm -hmm. on television the other day, and he was saying that he feels that for most Chinese, what's happening is that they're reoccupying the place they occupied in the world for 1800 of the last 2,000 years. That in fact for 1800 of the last 2,000 years, China did have the largest economy, uh, the largest uh, economy in the world. And in that context, I wonder, is there a residual resentment about what happened after 1820 uh, and up until uh, and up until Mao took over this whole business of the foreign powers <laughs> occupying yeah. uh, the ports and you know sailing gunboats up and down their rivers and mm -hmm. uh, you know forcing them to sell opium. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> I mean the, it was a, it was a, you know having a park where uh, a Japanese businessman could go with his wife and his dog and right. a Chinese wasn't allowed right. to enter. And so could a Frenchman and a Brit. And so could a American. Frenchman. And a, and a Brit and, and an American. Yeah. I mean, all of the all of the uh, uh, great powers. You know, a German field marshal occupying the uh, summer palace after putting down the, mm -hmm. the the forbidden city after putting down the the Boxer Rebellion and right. making no secret of what a low low opinion he had of the Chinese and mm -hmm. the kind of immigration regulations that we had here in the United States of Chinese exclusion. You know, massacring the Chinese in Rock Springs and then forcing them back underground into the coal mine and being that point okay, well, for the Union Pacific. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, it, that that's part of the um, that's part of the myth of China. It's part of the it's in the textbooks. That link is very clearly made between the humiliation. It's the period of humiliation. It's the carving up of the melon. Um, it's the and it's that sense that that's that's. It, many people tie their mistrust of what's currently going on very directly back to that. There's a lot of symbolism in that. And of course there's very, I mean, it, it did happen to them it very much. And there's that sense that we can't be weak like that again. And hence that does motivate them to, um, well, in order to be protected, we do need aircraft carriers. We do, you know, we do need a large military. We need these things for our own protection. So in some ways then that story and that myth can be the motivator for what they do. Of course, we can, again, but then the security dilemma can kind of kick in. We'll see it as, you know, it can lead to that kind of escalation. So I think we need to understand, that's the point. This is one of the things I think that is um, kind of an important part of, in the executive branch of the American government, kind of that recognition that, that's what I mean about style. You know, does it really cost you anything to tell China and kind of recognize, re recognize that they want respect? and recognize how sensitive they are about that, they're so sensitive about that, that, um, you know, it, it means that you do say things 50 times. It means that if Hu Jintao comes to visit, you don't give him a lunch, you give him a state dinner. You do those games, those things are extremely important. It's a saving face idea. Why not do those things? Because it's actually easy to do those things. Because if you don't, it does bring up that memory. And that is, it is linked. And if you look at how people are taught and just the way student, educated students, you know, talk about their history, it always comes back to that. It, it's mentioned all the time. So even though it's a hundred and, uh, what is that, almost 200 years ago? Well, actually, the, fir the first and second opium wars, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, 160 years ago, it's right there. It's right there in the memory. What's in our memory? Okay, 9-11. Boy, that's in our memory. And that's shaped a lot of what we do. Now, that's only 10 years old. Um, but there's a, there are things like that that shape how you respond. Actually, the, the hostage crisis in Iran, that's a good example of one that really kind of makes Iran kind of a visceral, you know, you have a visceral reaction. It makes it emotional, symbolic. Um, I guess I'm arguing for kind of rationality and balance in, the, in, in our discussions. And just recognize the power of, of symbols and stuff like that. Um, and so th that's what I mean about kind of having that leaders matter and that these are choices. We don't have to respond viscerally because of something that happened 160 years ago. But oh boy, that, that's how it's primed. And so what you want to do in the Chinese of context, in the context of Chinese leadership is, if nationalism gets wrapped around symbols like that in the public, then you want to tamp it down. 
I think, because I don't think they want to be trapped by that kind of thing either. Yes? What's uh, China's memory of the Vietnam War? Oh, <laughs> I can tell you one thing. Having the United States um, uh, warming up and rebasing in Vietnam doesn't play well. I mean, huge I mean, animosity. Uh, tit for tat with them for over that. I mean, well, I mean, um, you know, it's interesting because I mean, well, Vietnam and Vietnam and China have a huge history right, of, of disliking each other <laughs> very, very much, and it's the Chinese who. Um, were really known for um, anything that came down through um, China on rails to kind of, you know from the Soviets to kind of help out the North the North Vietnamese the Chinese kind of stole stuff um, off but yeah it's it's they don't like it it's not just that we're encircling them it's that we're dealing with Vietnam oh yeah that's bad Burma oh boy now isn't that a nice example of we're promoting democracy um, well they have been um, they, they saw Burma as a really important um, point of contact for them in that part of Southeast Asia. And now the United States kind of steps in and starts deplacing them, or displacing them, I mean. Um, yeah, it's tough. Because if anything, China sees itself as the natural leader in the region. But remember, the United States has kind of been invited back in by the Vietnamese oh, and by absolutely. others because they're nervous of China. I mean, China is, they need China and they fear China. I mean, it's just classic. I mean, they're, 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 that could be an American perspective of that. No, I think, I actually think it's their perspective too. I think they see it, the advantage of having the U.S. kind of back in there to balance. Um, yeah. To balance again. It, but it's a kind of a real politic answer I'm giving you, isn't it? Kind of balancing and stuff like that. Right. But I think they're good about playing one off the other. Um, and so, in that sense, it's just interesting how the U.S. I mean, the U.S. George Bush ignored this part of the world when he was, um, law, except for counterterrorism policy. The Chinese really had kind of free reign in a sense. Um, we would be interested if we were doing, uh, you know, anti-terrorism activities in, in Indonesia or things like that. But we really didn't engage. We have re-engaged in multi in regional multilateral organizations. We rejoined the East Asian Summit. I'm actually doing it for the first time. We're involved in areas where the Chinese thought they were kind of the ones, and they were trying to shape things. And um, even the even uh, the Japanese leadership that you know kind of started out not wanting to deal with the U.S. You know they turn around. It, it's a, I mean, it, there is true, there is veracity to the real politic world, balancing one off of the other. But boy, they need each other at the same time because their economies are tied to the Chinese. Um, the growth in, in China. But you know, it, it's, if you visit Hanoi and you visit the War Museum, I mean, it's it, it's obvious. I mean, the French and the American wars are just minor blips in the ongoing struggle against the, Chinese, against the Chinese, which has been going on for, for thousands uh, of, of years. And the other thing I saw, that the Chinese are so rich now. And it's kind of like Texans in Colorado. You know, the Chinese, there's some beautiful areas there around Haiphong so forth and so on. And the Chinese are just flowing in in huge numbers and buying condominiums and buying beachside villas and uh, there's, yeah, it, there's resentment in the local there, population. There's resentment everywhere though where China's invested because China tends to come in and deal with the government. It cuts deals for trade deals and strategic relationships. They come in and they build dams, they build infrastructure and they extract oil and other um, you know, um, materials. Um, and what they do is they displace local economies. So in a sense, then they kind of come in and deal with, it, in authoritarian places, in Africa, I'm thinking in the African context in particular. And, um, you know, they're not loved. You know, there's that sense that China is, has no strings attached to foreign policy. That's not the case. And it's not felt that way. So, you know, Chinese business people get kidnapped now, too. <laughs> so, uh, and that's one of the things that's interesting because I think that Ch because China's been involved pretty heavily first in their neighborhood and now over a dozen years and you know heavily in Africa, it's very much resource based. But you know they've learned that actually global norms, global rules, cooperation work for them too because they recognize that they want they need stability to to, to have their mines and their industrial facilities work as well. So that's a that's an area for shared interest actually actually, isn't it? So that's, that's that idea of making them part of the system so that they adhere to the rules. <laughs>
And I think that's actually happened in, in a lot of areas. Uh, Nancy. You mentioned a couple of things, total switch of subject here. Um, when you were talking, you said a lot of protests that we never hear about, but then you also mentioned social media. I'm assuming the social media is primarily confined to the rich coastal areas and not the poor interior. Is that true, untrue? Um, and, and would the people in the rich areas have any reason to use social media like it's been used in the Middle East? Over the last well, it's years? okay, it's youth driven. But you know, the Jasmine Revolution didn't take off, right, did it? Right, right. Um, but um, there are, oh, it's, it's, it's not internet, it's not email. It's um, texting. Okay, it's, it's cell phones, yep. and they, the go Chinese government has not found a way to control that. And, and so you do get things organized on a dime. Yeah. That way, actually. And um, but um, the same people. Okay, I think you know cell phones are what you know. Other parts of the world don't rely on landlines, though. I mean, they kind of leapfrogged over that. And so almost any cell phones are so cheap. Everybody has them. But when the youth, I think the, you know, the youth that are there are much like the youth here. They're interested in getting together with their friends, and you know, they're not terribly interested in ha having a political, some political protest. I mean, um, and I, I think it, it will. That's why, though, the Chinese government try, pays so much attention to jobs, and they recognize that youth unemployment is destabilizing, and they want to deal with it. But they're kind of, you know, we're, they're four or five years into that. And, you know, what happens over time? That could get worse, couldn't it? Um, but I think they're very, uh, the same group then that really relies on social media, um, have greater access to it, they're also the winners in the system. Yeah. So they, why would, they're not, and they want to help others, but they don't necessarily, and, and they're in urban areas. Um, let me just say it's not confined to the coast. The kind of building investment that you see, it's in Urumqi. I mean, keep in mind, Keep in mind, a small town has two million people. Okay, I mean, Laramie is a shocker when they you know, drive up. When they when they leave Fort Collins, they feel like they're going to the moon. <laughs> Unless they're from um, western part of China. I mean, there's some places in China, particularly in Xinjiang province, that look like this. As a matter of fact, I mean, in the Inner Mongolia, it looks like this. Um, but um, that is a country of contradictions. It really is. But I think even the people who have a sense, you know, know that they're, maybe they haven't benefited economically, they think their kids can. And so I think you still have that going on. There's a lot of sacrifice that happens um, with a parent going to work in that shirt factory down in Guangzhou, um, or that young person so that, their so that their younger brother, if they have a younger brother, or their cousin can go to school. So there, that's a, I mean that that's really going on. That is a difference. But how long can you maintain that? I, I don't know. Um, I mean, China is a it's it's really a fascinating place, and um, and there's a lot of similarities, a lot of differences. And, I, and the other thing I would say is that I guess I think we need to grow up and just recognize that if we want to promote our interests vis-a-vis -vis China, which are often very different but are in many cases similar then we have to, it, it makes sense to deal with them. It, it makes sense to recognize them, that they are an important power on the world stage. It, it, you know, we, we're able to deal with a lot of countries that we disagree with on a host of things, but we're able to kind of move forward. Because it was kind of your comment, Dan, that, I mean, no, nobody wants it to escalate to a hot conflict. But the thing is, is there's a gap between kind of how we are pragmatic and how we deal with them day to day and our rhetoric. Our rhetoric is much more volatile, and our rhetoric gets very volatile in election cycles. I think the Chinese understand that now. I'm actually glad the Chinese understand the way the American system works. I mean, we're a democracy. This is diverse voices at play. Um, they now send people over to be congressional fellows and to do internships in Congress. Because they finally, for, until about 10 years ago, they exclusively focused on studying the executive branch. How can you only study the executive branch and understand U.S. policy toward China when all trade policy, uh, anything like that, comes out of Congress? You have to understand. You have to be patient with the cycles, <laughs> um, and I think they understand that better. I don't think the Chinese public understands that. So I gave a lecture. I gave lectures about the nature of the American system, and really differentiated. Kind of went through the last six administrations and talked about Congress. 
and because it was something that was, it was, you know, it was a different take for the students. Um, we're kind of maybe we're out of time, and if anybody wants to, you know, chat a little bit more, but um, some people probably want to go home. And I want to I want to thank you and just say that that um, there's a talk that's coming up in Laramie on. Um, Yes, we might want you to try to come down to Laramie as well. <laughs> I'd like to come uptown. But it's the Future of American Formulations, Challenges and Prospects. It's a panel discussion which features uh, Dr. Stephen Krasner from Stanford University. Um, he, um, we're also hoping to have a barbecue with him and with uh, Tanya Bertzel and Tomas Risa who have their summer home up here, friends of mine and probably friends of many of you. Uh, that um, that will be coming up. And so I hope you'll sign up, put your email down, we'll let you know about that uh, when it happens. But the talk uh, with Steve Krasner is on the 11th in Laramie. Um, we actually don't have a venue for it yet, but if you give us your email, we'll make sure it gets sent to you. Um, the neat thing about that is that um, Steve was head of policy planning in the State Department under Condi Rice and also served in the National Security Council in the George Bush administration. So um, he's an optimistic realist, maybe, <laughs> is the way to uh, term it. But, you know, somebody who's kind of been in the thick of some of this decision making and thinking about it. And it'll be kind of an assessment of where we are currently in general, not just China. Okay. And, all right. Thank you very much.